somebody say I am, we get ready to hear what they're talking about, right? What they mean. They may say I am uh, strong, you know, they might say I am honest, I might be, they might say I am funny. Some of y'all fit that category, Sam. Uh, I could do that because me and Sam were both funny, so. Uh, but there's a lot of things that we take for granted that when we hear somebody say, I am, we start listening for character, uh, traits that substantiate exactly what that I am means. And I believe as we go into, well, you know, you're, is, you know, you're here today. You desire to hear what God says. But when Jesus says, I am, I think we need to have double listening of capabilities, to hear what it is that he has said, and to make sure that we understand that I am who is Jesus and how that impacts our lives. We want to have a relationship. We hear it. It's not about church. It's about a relationship. And I want us to understand that the characteristic traits that in the book of John that Jesus says I am give us something to look for that we may say, I get that. We've seen him talk about, I am the bread of life. And, uh, you know, that his word, you know, we know that Jesus is the word. And then we see him as the light of the world, how he shines. And darkness flees because Jesus is the only one that can give us that kind of light. Amen. And I believe it's important that we understand that. And then last week, Andy preached an awesome message on the good shepherd, how he is going to take care of us. And we... He looked at uh, uh, Psalm 22, 23, and 24, and I, th I just really enjoyed last week's message. But to know that we have a shepherd that's looking after us to protect us and give us exactly what we need. This week, we're going to hear Jesus say, I am the door. If you'll take your Bibles out, we're going to look at John chapter 10. We're going to read verses 7 through 10. If you would, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. And here's what it says. It says, Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, that's usually say, hey, listen, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep do not listen to them. I am the door. It's a sentence all by itself. It stands alone. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out of fi and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I come that you may have life and have it abundantly. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your, your just the, your means, that you've given us everything we need through Jesus. Uh, I pray that we would slow down just a little bit. Um, as it was brought out in Sunday school this morning in our class, uh, let us desire to hear what you got to say. Lord, let us hear from you. Let us Put aside what we think. Let us put aside the things that we hold important. But Lord, let's just for this few moments, let us hear that still small voice in a way that your word just shouts truth to us as to I am. And Lord, I just pray that we will fulfill the purpose in which you've called us, that you would give us a direction and a desire to glorify you. And we ask all this in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. This week we're going to talk about the door. The door. Uh, we think of a door. We think of a means of entrance into a, a place. A door, an entrance into a, uh, an area, if you will. Uh, it has different ways of being saying that. Door, gate, whatever. But it's a, it's a means to go through into a location in which we desire to be a part of um, and in this case the whole chapter is about the good shepherd but he brings out this door and he says I am the door of the sheep now sheep I don't know if you knew this or not and I think Andy may have touched on it last week but sheep are not the brightest animals on the face of the earth they're they're a little slow when it comes to listening to understanding um, they want to do it their own way if you take a, a hundred sheep and you throw them out in the middle of a uh, area 
they're not going to stick together. They're going to go all in their own direction. They're going to go everywhere they want to go instead of being protected as a herd. And Jesus is very clear as he says, I am the door of the sheep. Now we as Christians, we are called God's sheep. And we're to listen to what he says. He wants to be that good shepherd for us. But in order for that to happen, we have to actually enter into his fold. Okay? And I believe that is imperative that we get that, that we understand that the door is Jesus himself. Um, you know, we see the picture, and I've heard the an analogy that, that Jesus is the door to eternal life. Uh, Jesus is the door to an abundant life. We see that in our passage. Uh, it is how we get to heaven. And I've, I've heard it said many times that the, uh, the key to heaven was made on the cross. Well, I want to go one step farther. The door was made there on the cross. Without Jesus, we have no entrance into heaven or abundant life as Christ would have us to have. And I believe that if we desire those things and we know that Jesus is the door, it gets us closer to a place that we understand what it is God's trying to say. We make things too hard here in the church. We make things too hard when it comes to uh, seeing the pictures in which Jesus, he, he used a lot of analogies, he used metaphors, but in this case, a door. There are a lot of people, and many of you have found the right door the right door. You've come in. You know what it is to be part of the fold. And uh, I'm grateful for that. But many have found another door, the wrong door. And the wrong door is not what we perceive here on earth. Uh, we, it's about our flesh. It's about how we see things, what we want, how we as sheep have gone astray, if you will. But when we go in the right door, we find ourselves in the fold and we can enjoy the protection, the provision, the providence in which God always intended for us to have. It's when we as sheep take and go out and try to find the wrong door. So today I want us to look at one very short little understanding is what it, does your door look like? What does your door look like? When you're standing at the door, when you walk up to your door at your house, you recognize that door, do you not? Uh, when you go into a door uh, from a different facility, I know every door at this facility, um, I know them well. I know which key I got to get out. I know how what's going to be behind that door. But what does your door look like as far as abundant life? What does your door look like when it comes to eternity? And these are questions that we have to ask ourselves in order that we might take it one step farther, that we can help somebody to the door. Amen. And I hope this is going to be a message that rings clear to all of us. Um, I was challenged this week. I, I had the basics for my sermon laid out, but I'm really burdened, as every year, evangelism time, we should have that burden all year long on bringing people to the Lord. Amen. So point number one. Let's talk a little bit about the wrong door, the wrong door. Verses 7 and 8, and then we're going to tie the first part of verse 10. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the, thief did not, uh, but the sheep did not listen to them. And then verse 10, the first part says, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Um. There just seems to be a lot more people like this gate. This gate that people tend to congregate around. The, the gate that people find that's easy to get into. There's no, uh, there's no boundaries. You just go and you just, it's where the party's at, amen? It's where the crowd is going. And I think that we have to be very careful about that, but we need to look at John eight forty four. And this is not in your bulletin, so you might want to write it down. Uh, are you, uh, when we think about this big gate and how those that are watching the gate, we've got to wonder who's taking charge and who's leading this. And as Jesus said in this passage, they're liars, thieves, and murderers. But in John eight forty four, we read, are you, you are your father, the devil, and the will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. 
When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Man, how many people follow that uh, character trait as they go into life? And then we read in 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Can you imagine going into a corral as a sheep and there's a lion in there? And that's exactly what people see. They see this big gate and they see that they can get in very easily and they jump in there and then they find that there's a lion. And then they're going to start backstepping. For the, what reason is that? Is Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. They start saying, what have I got myself into? The wrong gate will always look good. The wrong gate will be enticing and it will be something that draws and we'll see a lot of people around that gate. But until we get in there and see who's in charge of the gate, we have a problem. And sometimes that is where we go astray. So I ask you, is your door wide and easy uh, to enter? Anyone can get in there. Well, Matthew 7 verse 13 says, For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter it are many. And that's the reason why I said it. it's easy to get into. There's no restrictions. It doesn't take you doing anything in particular. All you got to do is go in. And I believe that is sometimes the, the reason why so many people have no understanding that they're going in at the wrong door. And I believe that as they go through and they're looking for the easy way, and, and you know, I'm, I'm guilty. I've had times in my life that I, I was looking for the easy way out. And I found the wrong door many times. And I say this because there are things in Scripture that tell us, and we, we, we see this as Jesus himself tells us, wide is the gate. Many that go in here, and when Jesus says this, we need to take notice. And this is uh, taking place right after the Sermon on the Mount. And, he, and it, he's trying to tell everybody, there's a better way. That's the reason I am here. And what he wants us to do is also to look for the signs. Now, sometimes we don't read the signs when we go through places. We might have a, see a posted sign. We may see uh, something you need to look out for. I can remember uh, in Florida, every time you went down to the boat landing or even swimming areas, they had signs there that showed alligators. It was something you had to contend with. So you looked, and you looked at the signs, and you didn't just look at the printed signs, but you looked at the signs in nature and the things that your body's being drawn to. The signs that we go on in uh, Matthew 7, verses 15 and 16, he says, Beware of false prophets who come uh, to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. The grapes gathered from the thorn, or grapes gathered from thorns, or figs from thistles. And I believe sometimes we see people that are saying, come on in, come on in. And we can go down to all different kinds of places, and they'll say, it's all right, come on in. But we have to look at the signs. Are we going to go in and find what it is that God had intended for us? Or are we going to look at the signs and listen to what the Lord says? You see, sometimes the wrong door leads to death. Ultimately, as far as eternity, it always leads to death. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There's a way that seems right to man. This ends, it ends in the way of death. If we continually look for the door that we have found, that we like, that we see no obstacles, that we see the crowd there, that's where the party is, and we don't recognize what's inside the gate, the door, the wrong door, then we're looking for destruction. If we follow our own paths, we will find problems. And I believe that is imperative that we continue to look for the right door. Amen? And that's point number two, the right door. Verse 9 and then verse 10, the second part, it says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. He will go in and out and find pasture. I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. 
we have to understand that Jesus came for a purpose. First, we know John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see, God sent his Son to be all these I am's that we've been studying. The door is the right door. Jesus will always be the right door. Now, let me ask you a little question. Is Jesus' door always the easy door? No. But I tell you what, sometimes it's hard to get in that door that we perceive. But he did all the work. He was the one that went to the cross of Calvary. He was the one that died for your sins and mine. He was the one that received the wrath of God so that we might have entrance into an abundant life and eternity with that very door. But it's the door of what? The sheep. So that makes him our shepherd. I look forward to being with the shepherd because he's always protected me. He's always been there for me. Isaiah 55 verses 6 through 8 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Have you listened? Can you hear the Lord? Do you ever feel yourself being pushed in the direction in which the Lord wants you to go? Conviction maybe, or maybe just a desire to fulfill the will of God in your life. It says, call upon me while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the righteous men his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. And I thought that about that for a minute, and I think about those that have come to the place that we recognize the shepherd but we see the door in which we must go through, and that's living the body of Christ, being part of the church, doing the things that God has uh, put in place that we can return to Him. He created us, did He not? He created us to worship Him and to live with Him for eternity. That's the reason why He made a garden. But we like to mess things up, don't we? It goes on to say that He may have compassion on Him and to our God, for he will ab uh, abundantly pardon. That's one thing I like about our shepherd. He forgets. He has a short memory when it comes to our sins. If we go in the right door and we find that, set, that the shepherd's there, we go through his door, then we can find that he wants to forgive us. He wants to pardon us. And he does this because he brings out a very true statement that, that I think we need to recognize, and that's, Isaiah 55, verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and neither are, my ways your, are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. So I ask, is your door narrow and controlled? The door to your house, do you let just anybody in? I don't. I stop a lot of people at the door. Hello, how can I help you? And they'll go on, but I don't just let anybody. My door is sometimes open. But not just anybody comes in. And I believe that's important that we understand that it's the same way with the Lord. Matthew 7, and we're staying in this context as Jesus is there on the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 7, 14, 14 says, For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. I, you know, I, I, I've, I've often asked myself, you know, it would have been pretty cool if God had just come around and just said, you come on. You come on, you come on, you come on. You see, God's not, he didn't make a bunch of puppets. He gave you free will. Amen? Aren't you glad that he made you an individual? I'm glad that he gives me some choices in the matter. But when we come to the door, it's up to us to fulfill what he has done for us. We have to do it his way. Um, Frank Sinatra liked that song, I Did It My Way. Our way will never get us into the right door. Our way will never qualify us to be part of the Lord's flock. Our way will always bring destruction to our lives because it seems right to us. That's the reason why we like it so much. It's I did it my way. But Jesus says you need to do it my way, Jesus' way. And that's why he says we need, to, we need to stop looking at what it is that we want because that's the reason we can't find the right door. That's the reason why we can't find happiness in the church. That's the reason why we can't find happiness in our lives is because we're not with the shepherd and doing it in his flock, his way, 
in that narrow gate. Invitation is only by, uh, our entry is only by invitation. In Luke 13, we read in verse 24, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. There are a lot of people that say they're Christian. There's a lot of people that go to church. There's a lot of people that, that carry their Bibles. There's a lot of people that put money in the offering plate. But until you come to the understanding that Jesus is the door and the only way we can get into that flock is through Jesus, the I am, the door, we're not going to have a part in that. It says we, not only did, we can seek to enter, but we're not going to be able to. You've got to have that key that we talked about. But until that door is open and we can't go in, we have to ask ourselves, is it controlled? It's by invitation. You have to be invited. Uh, John 6, 44, no one can come in, uh, unless the Father who sent me draws him. That's the Holy Spirit, amen? We've seen fruit and we've seen the Holy Spirit. We have to have that fruit of the Spirit the way I think it is, that they're drawn to the right door. And I will raise up on that last day. You see, the Father has said, you are my sheep. And he wants us to be gathered, but we have to be willing to be drawn to that door. In John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Would you agree with this statement? There was a time in your life that you felt something tugging at you that drew you to a place that you were willing to go through the door of salvation and say, yes, Jesus is the reason. We have to understand that the door has restrictions. If you try to get in, I, 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 you know, I used to use this phrase myself. I don't use it anymore because I don't agree with it anymore. How many of you ever heard this? If God closes the door, or if the door shuts, I'll just find a window to go in. Amen? Some of you are saying, you're not, you're not very acclimated this morning. I, I know that I have said that before. I'm going to find a way to get in, whatever. But until we do it Jesus' way, we're not going to get in. That's the abundant life. That's the protection. That's the provisions, the providence, all these things that we look for through Jesus, our Lord and Savior, our provider. But ultimately, it comes from that tug that you once felt. It comes from somebody saying, go this way. Somebody taking the scripture and saying, thus saith the word of God. And then the Holy Spirit tugs and he squeezes. I remember telling my mom as an eight-year-old boy, I can remember telling her, I said, Mama, I feel like an elephant is sitting on my chest. Oh, really? And she started, it was Easter Sunday. And I remember her asking me some questions, and, and then we understood that it was conviction, and it was because of my sin, but I wanted in the door. I wanted in there where Jesus was at to take care of me and to heal me from my sin. But it took conviction and a draw. And I believe sometimes we don't understand that, and we just tell people, will you just repeat this prayer after me? We're on shaky ground when we do that. I believe we have to under, help them understand what the Lord has done for us. It's not just about a prayer. Now, I know that prayer gives some of us peace, and that, that prayer is something that we can follow around, uh, along. Well, I know that that prayer also gives us, puts words in our mouth that we can't, sometimes, you know, we don't know what to say. But to just tell somebody you say this prayer, you're in. See, it takes a drawing from the Father to do that. And when we do that, what does that, what can we expect behind that door? What can we expect when we get in the door? Remember a while ago we talked about you get in and you see murderers and liars and thieves and just destruction. But this little narrow door, the one that we can't get in unless we got an invite. The one that we go through with the expectation that things are going to be all right. What can we find? Well, let's continue in Matthew chapter 7. Verses, start with verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, 
and it will be open to you. And the good to know the door will open when you knock. For every one who has it receives, and one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks it will be open. Want, uh, or which one of you, if it was his son, asked for him bread, would you give him a stone? Or if he asked for fish, would he give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, how, how much more to, to give good gifts to your children? But how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? You see, once we realize the right door and once we step through that door of provision, that providence that we've been looking for, the, uh, the guidance that we need, then we can start asking things in relation to the shepherd and say, hey, I would like this. I would like to serve in this capacity. I would like to have strength to do this in the flock. You see, that's when the Lord says, it's my will that these things be done. So yes, I will give these things to you. I'm not a big fan of saying like a genie. Lord, I want $100,000 in my checking account. Lord, I want a new car. Lord, I need a new house. Now, those things are okay to ask for. But that's not what we're here to do. We're here to do what? To, feel, to fulfill the purpose of the Father. We're here to glorify God. We're here to help others find the right door. Amen? Now, that, that, you know, you might, well, I'm not, I'm, not that, I'm not that way. Yes, we are. Aren't you glad somebody told you about the door? Aren't you glad somebody told you about Jesus and said, you know what? He loves you. He died for you. He will forgive you of your sins. You just got to enter in through the door. I'm glad somebody showed me. As a little boy, I had a, a, an RA teacher, and he made me understand that for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I realized what sin was, and because of that sin, I couldn't go through the door. Because of that sin, I couldn't get in to see who Jesus really was. And then I had teachers all through the time that taught me, well, now that you're in the door, you need to understand and talk to him by prayer, but more so listen to what he says through his word. So somebody was showing me through the door, but how to understand and to fulfill what it was that I was going to get when I got through the door. I'm so glad that somebody showed me the right door. Now, I know evangelism conference just happened, but I believe it's important that we understand that we're to be showing others to the right door. Matthew 7, and I, you know, I've always wondered why this verse was right there in the middle of all this gates and narrow and wide and all this. And I've, I, until this week, and I'm, this, was, this was my big aha moment. And right in the middle of all these verses, in verse 12, Matthew chapter 7, it says, So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. Now let's think about that for a minute. I have eternal life through Jesus Christ. He's my Savior. He's my door. Somebody showed me Jesus. Somebody helped me to go through that door. Jesus said himself, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. How many people in your life can you see that are floundering? They're looking for something. There's doors all around. We were talking this week and some of the, the conversations that I've seen is that we, we, we hear these phrases, be true to yourself. Have resolve to do what you want to do. Stay strong in your way of life. Those are all wrong doors. Amen. Without Jesus and the door into his provision, you're lost and undone. How much more do we need to do unto others as somebody had done to us and show them the way. A passage I want to use to bring us to that is Mark 2, verses 2 through 5. You'll recognize the story as soon as we get to reading it. It says, And many were gathered together 
so that there was no more room, not even at the door. I thought it was just fitting, Ben, we're preaching on the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let him down on the bed where he lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. There's a lot of things that transpire in those short few, few verses there. One, somebody needed some help, amen. He couldn't do it himself. He needed somebody to carry him to the door. He said, but then they got there and they couldn't get through the door. So they had to work on getting them to the door, Jesus. And I believe it's important that we understand that we are to help people to come to the, the understanding of who Jesus is. So as four men carried this paralytic, the one who had no means, that had no understanding of how to get to the door or into the door to Jesus, they made a way. Now I had Sam hand out a bunch of cards. Did anybody not get their cards? On that card, it talks about our church. There's a QR code on there. If you need one, just let me know. We'll get you some more. We got more. Raise your hand and we'll get you one. On there thing is a QR code, and if you'll take your phone, put it on that, it will take you straight to our web page, and it'll say more than what I could put on a little business card. Okay? It'll tell, us, tell, tell the individual what we believe, and it's going to give them the salvation, the understanding of salvation. But as this story, we see four people carrying a paralytic. My, I kind of turned the flip the script, if you will. I've given each of you four cards. Now, I don't want you to just go leave them laying somewhere. I don't want you to just go hand them to somebody randomly on the street. This might be a family member. This might be a friend. But I want you to know this individual, that you can pray for them by name. Before you hand them the card, pray for them by name. Pray that the Lord will make himself known that they would be drawn to the right door. Pray that they would take the initiative to understand what it is that you should be telling them about your finding the door, your testimony, and that they would say, yeah, I would like to go through that door myself. You say, well, I don't have four friends. Well, you need to go make four friends this week. Everybody needs a friend, amen? That's the reason why some people have such a hard time smiling. They don't have enough friends to keep them laughing. Okay, friends will make you laugh. Amen. But I think of people, even at last week when I was at a, a celebration or a funeral for my, my mentor, all the way through the surface, um, hour and 40 minutes, people talked about this man. But everything that was about the man was pointing to Jesus. And that's what they were talking about. That hour and 40 minutes went by like that. We were saying amen. We were smiling. We were laughing. Because we knew that he was pointing people to the door. I want us to have that reputation. I want us to have somebody, when we get to the Bema seat, that they'll be standing there and said, it's because you showed me the way to the door. I am in. I'm here. Amen. So you've got four cards. And if you need more cards after that, you come and see me. But I want you to tell me the story about how you gave those out. Now some people are going to take and they'll throw them in their car. They'll lay them on their dresser. They'll lay them someplace and forget about them. You see, the Lord challenged me on this passage here, and I think he's going to challenge all of us. Four cards, that ain't hard. D.L. Moody would not go to bed at night until he had not just witnessed to somebody, but led somebody to the Lord, showed them the door, prayed with them to how to get in, and helped them to see what life everlasting is about. Every day, D.L. Moody, remember that name. 
He's the one that's going to have the big crowd following him around when we get to heaven. Find four people that you care about. Now, if they know the Lord, uh-uh. You've got to find somebody that don't know the Lord. Those are the ones, you know, we like to say, well, I'm going to stick with my church friends. I'm going to stick with my Christian friends. We can't be fruitful unless we're out in the world sharing the fruit with the people who don't have fruit. Share with them the card. Show them how to use that QR code. But show them the door. And see. let's see what God will do. You see, until, you know, it's a known fact that if we just sit here in our congregation and we do our little thing and we never reach out and ask people to come join us. We may have one or two come in. I've had people come in here, well, I'm looking for a good Baptist church. I said, well, I think you might have found one. But that's by happen chance. But 80% of the people, if you would just invite them, chances are they might come because they're going to know somebody here. So I'm asking you to go invite somebody. Help bring them to the door. What does your door look? That's what I ask us to do and what we asked when we started this. What does your door to eternity look like? You see, I believe we need to look at that, that door that we've come through, that narrow gate. Maybe you haven't come through a door. The Lord might be wanting you to come. If you feel a tugging at your heart, you need to get that thing settled today. Don't leave here knowing that you're not in the door. Come on in and see what he has for you. So I ask him, what did your door look like? And my application for today, Revelation 3, verse 20. I've used this for uh, soul winning many, many times. But I believe this verse kind of uh, helps us to understand once we're at the door. It's, it's kind of amazing. We say that you can't get in. You have to be invited. But the thing is, it's up to you to open the door. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That's Jesus, the door. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that Jesus is standing there at the door ready to greet you? Let's bring somebody to the door. Let them meet Jesus. Show them the way. Show them that you love them like Jesus loved them. And let them see Jesus in everything that you say and do. That's the reason why I used the psalm that we did. I want to be a, a doorkeeper. I want to sit there and say, here's the door. Can I help open the door for you? Amen. We got a challenge. But we have to understand that Jesus is that door. We have to understand that he wants people to come. He does. He loves us. He laid down his life for you and for me. But he also laid down his life for everybody who's walking up and down the streets of Bernalillo, Rio Rancho, Placitas. Wherever we might call home, dwelling, we go out to town. He left us a job to do, and that is to show people to the door. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your blessings. We thank you for the door. We thank you for the invitation that we have had. Lord, I thank you so much that one day I heard that voice and I was drawn to the door and I said, yes, I want to go in. And I asked Jesus to forgive me of my sins, but more so I asked him to be the Lord of my life, to guide me, to help me grow, to mature into a, 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 an adult Christian, if you will. that I might help others to see the way, that I might teach others where the door's at. Now, Lord, I ask you today in this congregation that you'd stir, that you'd move in all of our hearts. Give us a burden for lost souls. I can only imagine what was on the heart of Christ as he was nailed to the cross and he thought about everybody, every person that would say yes to the door the very sins that were laid upon him, every sin. He was made sin. He received the wrath. But Lord, at that time, he was thinking about those that would say yes. They would hear that knock. 
and you would open. And there you would be, all glorious and lifted up. And I pray that we would desire that for others. And I pray you would break our hearts for what broke yours. And I just thank you for what you're doing in the lives of your people here at First Baptist. Maybe those that are listening. But Lord, I pray that we would be diligent about what it is that we found at the door. And let us share with others. And we ask this in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. We're going to go turning your hymnals to page.